and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico, and it is my great honor to welcome each and every one of you into the Puritan Barn once again for the Midnight Ride with myself and John Pounders. Tonight, for those of you that like to uncover ancient mysteries and hidden secrets, this ride is for you. The Giants of Tartaria, guaranteed to be more fun than a Chinese balloon. So get ready. It all starts right now because we are now live, live, live. What's up, guys? Once again, from the Pearson Barn, we're here to do this show. I know we're so excited to be here. I know David is. We were talking before the show. This is going to be one of those interesting ones that people like us love. And if you're not like us, you may not love it. You may you may have to change the channel because for some people, they don't really care about learning about the roots of civilizations. They don't care about learning biblical stuff. But for those of you guys that do, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be something that really just kind of um, changes the way you look at the Scripture, which is our goal in every show. And if you can't tell, our goal is to make people take a deep look at Scripture and realize there's things in there that we haven't been taught and we haven't been, talk- haven't been talked about in a long time in the church. And so I'm excited. Let us know where you're from in the chat. David, how's your week been? It's been fantastic. The Lord is just pouring out His blessings, is just so thankful and You know, we've done several shows on Tartaria, and still there's more to know, there's more to find, and it's just like peeling an onion. The more we find out, the more we can connect more dots, and the more the picture becomes just a little bit clearer. That's right, and before we get started tonight, I wanted to remind you guys about a couple things. One is we are going to be doing in April a meet and greet in Tennessee, and this time David's going to be there, so usually it's just either me or me and John going, or... Uh, David will have one here, but this time we 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 talked David in to coming out of the beautiful state of Indiana to go to Tennessee to Nashville to meet you guys. Also, Dan Bedoni will be there, uh, Joshua Watts, a couple other different people you guys may have not met, John Hall, his wife, Patricia. So it's going to be really cool. Uh, looking forward to, to the big meeting that we're going to have there in Nashville, and we'll be discussing the particulars about that next week. So for those of you guys that are interested... Also, if you want to email, we can send you guys emails and stuff about that. Um, Also, we want to give a shout-out to all of our sponsors. We forgot to shout-out our sponsors last week, but we're going to do it this week. Joshua Watts Leather, joshuawatts.com, or wattsleather.com. You can look at the link description. But if you're looking for any kind of personalized leather products or uh, book covers, which I know that we have a lot of old books that we like to have amazing book covers on to keep them preserved and also just make them look fantastic you know it's always i I, for me anyway i when i read a book i like to i like to feel like that book uh has some weight to it and has some has some like antique to it and so like having this the leather on there is really awesome bracelets whatever you guys look at it check it out it's awesome stuff uh sugar and spice soap company.com um amazing soaps natural soaps you don't have to worry about rubbing toxic chemicals or unclean products on your body uh, they even have a Midnight Ride brand soap just for you guys, and you get a coupon code ten percent off uh, for in, and the code is NYSTV. Make sure to check that out. Also, check out our website nystv.org. Uh, for those of you that have been watching the last few weeks, you notice we've done a lot of Book of Enoch, and that's because we have a video Book of Enoch video commentary that David and myself are going through. David's leading us through this entire Book of Enoch, and so we're going through it line by line seeing if it lines up with Scripture, checking it out, and just giving a real thorough examination of the Book of Enoch, which has been a huge blessing to us. Uh, And you can get other things like documentaries, um, not not able to be seen on YouTube. I call it too good for YouTube. And you have the the stuff on there, and if you guys use the code RIDER, you'll get 
$8.99 off of your first month. So make sure to check that out. Also, FOJCRadio.com. Uh, David and Donna have been doing ministry for over 40 years, and all, most of their stuff is compiled onto this website. You can check out everything that they have going on, other shows, broadcasts that they have going on, etc., and books. I mean, just a wealth of information. So make sure you guys check out all of those links in the description. And um, with that, David, do you have anything else you would like to add before we go on? I think we're good to go. We're taking a night off this Sunday night. We're not going to have any extra broadcast outside of a regular, but we will be very soon. Well, very good, man. Well, let's get started. Let's kick it off. You guys are ready. I know you guys are because I am. So let's do this. Let's go. All right. The Giants of Tartaria. And this is another example of the wealth and the depth of information we can find from studying the Book of Enoch. And basically, we're going from a study of the Book of Enoch, chapter 68. And from there, we're going to go to the giants of our Tartaria. And these dots connect in a way that's just amazing. But Enoch, chapter 68, is a short chapter, and it consists of an angelic conversation between the angel Michael and the angel Raphael. And there are three statements that are made from Michael to Raphael. And this is the context of Enoch 68. Now, we'll give just a little bit of background on who Michael and Raphael are in the New Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible. It says of Raphael, in the books of Tobit and First Enoch, Raphael is one of the seven angels who stand in God's presence, identified as one of the archangels. And it also, we're going to see that Raphael appears in the King James Apocrypha in the book of Tobit. It says, uh, continuing, it says, Raphael hears the prayers of Tobit and Sarah and comes to their assistance. Disguised as a human, Raphael accompanies Tobit's son Tobias on his journey. And it, it goes on to say, he protects Tobias from the demon Asmodeus, who has killed Sarah's first seven husbands on their wedding night. I think this could very well be the, the lady that Jesus was talking about in Luke 20. But anyway, we see here in Enoch chapter 10 and verse 4, Raphael is an aggressor against the demonic powers. And again, the Lord said to Raphael, bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into the darkness and make an opening in the desert, which is Dudael, and cast him therein. Raphael is a powerful guy. He binds uh, Azazel. We also see him in the book of Tobit in the King James Apocrypha binding the devil Asmodeus, and we saw this uh, devil Asmodeus in a previous ride in the, uh, in the Testament of Solomon. In, in the book of Tobit, it says, And now God hath sent me to heal thee and Sarah thy daughter-in-law. I am Raphael, one of the seven holy angels, which present the prayers of the saints and which go in and out before the glory of the Holy One. And in the book of Tobit, chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, So the prayers of them both were heard before the majesty of the great God. And this is the role that Tob that Raphael plays. He's one of the seven archangels. And we know Michael. We're familiar with Michael, I think most of us. And in, uh, in the dictionary, it says this of Michael. Michael and Gabriel are the only two angels mentioned by name in the Bible. Michael is identified only at Daniel 10, 13, 21, and 12, 1, where he is described as one of the chief princes of the people of God. And when we look at what the scripture says about Raphael and about Michael, they are the chief restrainers with the angels of God. We are erroneously told by uh, modern theology that the Holy Spirit is the restrainer of Second Thessalonians 2. Nowhere do we see the Holy Spirit playing this role, but we see the angels restraining directly and binding these powers, Raphael and Gabriel. And in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 21, but I will shew thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, that there is none that 
holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. And if you would look that word holdeth up in your Strong's Concordance, you would see that that word means very specifically to restrain. So in Enoch chapter 68, we've set the stage. We have these two powerful angels, the two big guys. They're the restrainers of evil. And they're having a conversation, and it hinges around the episode of the judgment of the watchers that sinned with the, the episode of the sons of God and the daughters of men. Now, like I said in Ezekiel or in, in Enoch 68, the chapter in, in, entails three statements from Michael to Raphael. Let's read the first one. And after that, my grandfather Enoch gave me the teaching of all the secrets in the book of the parables which had been given to him, and he put them together for me in the words of the book of the parables. And on that day, Michael answered Raphael and said, The power of the Spirit transports and makes me to tremble because of the severity of the judgment of the secrets, the judgment of the angels, who can endure the severe judgment which has been executed and before which they melt away. Now, we were talking on just a very recent midnight ride about the hot springs and the angels of the waters, and we saw the fallen angels there being punished literally in boiling water and boiling metal. And the book of Enoch in the 67th chapter, it claimed that when the hot springs bubble up, this is because in the subterranean levels, this is where these angels are being punished. Now, that's rough. Now, here, here we got Michael and Raphael. They're saying, man, this is, this is tough, man. And these, they're literally trembling, it says. Yeah, like, trembling. yeah they're trembling. Cause, and, you know, these guys were formerly their pals. Yeah. I mean, they used to be together. And, and this scripture speaks of it here, Job 38. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So they were once all together. They were fellow workers for the Father. And then something went wrong. And we'll be getting into detail in the next ride just exactly what transpired to incite the angels to this fall but they were they were shook up that these mighty mighty powerful angels were trembling at the sight of their former companions being boiled in hot metal and water in the heart of the earth i mean it was rough now in enoch 68 and chapter 3 the second statement is and michael answered again and said to raphael who is he whose heart is not softened concerning it and whose reins are not troubled by this word of judgment that has gone forth upon them because of those who have thus led them out. And they are deeply troubled almost to the point of fussing with the Father just a little bit that, you know, you're being too hard on these guys. Now, in the final statement here, in Enoch chapter 68 and verse 4, it says this. Now, you notice now when Michael comes into the presence of the Father, it all changes. Yeah. You know, he, he changes his tone completely. He's yeah. not fussing with the Father anymore, Carol. Yeah. And in, 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 in verse 4, it says, And it came to pass, when he stood before the Lord of Spirits, Michael said thus to Raphael, I will not take their part under the eye of the Lord. He ain't going to stick up from them. Uh, nah. For the Lord of Spirits has been angry with them because they do as if they were the Lord. Therefore, all that is hidden shall come upon them forever and ever, for neither angel nor man shall have his portion in it, but alone they have received their judgment forever and ever. So now, Michael and Raphael, they're on the team, they're not fussing, and they go ahead and execute that which the Father gave them to do. Now, in Enoch chapter 14 and verse 3, it says, And has created and given to man the power of understanding the word of wisdom, so hath he created me also and given me the power of reprimanding the watchers, the children of heaven. This is one of my favorite parts of the book of Enoch, 
where Enoch actually goes and rebukes these fallen angels. And you just got to love it because here's these giant watchers. They come down. They're breeding a race of giants. And the Lord sends Enoch, that this little human, just like you and I, he walks over and he's rebuking these fallen angels. Mm -hmm. This should let us know and it should encourage our hearts of the victory and the authority that we have in Christ over these fallen powers. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to do a little midnight ride backmasking or unmasking the backmasking. Now, we've studied many, many uh, accounts of pagan mythology, and we've seen over and over that what we call mythology, they call theology, and that behind these myths and legends, there was a, 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 an event that was true which is being retold over and over in different ways with different names of gods and different scenarios. Now, what is being told here in, in Ezekiel, in Enoch chapter 68, the satanic version of that is the story of Prometheus. And in the story of Prometheus, we have the same scenario retold in their way. Now, in Prometheus, we're going to read the story of Prometheus from uh, the Collier's New Encyclopedia. And this new encyclopedia is a 1921. <laughs> so I like that. But we're going to read the story of Prometheus here. And Prometheus rebelled against Zeus. And for his punishment, he was sentenced to eternal liver nibbling. And he was chained to a rock. And his judgment was to have his liver nibbled on by a vulture forever. And when in the story, when they were telling the angels or, or these, uh, not the angels, but these other gods to chain Prometheus to the rock, the whole scenario like Enoch 68 is unfolding. Oh, you know, the regret, you know, yeah. wow, you know, he was one of us. You know, the whole story of the reluctance to chain Prometheus to the rock is retold. And it's the same story as Ezekiel 68. So it, we see here the story of Prometheus is their version of these events here. And it's very, very profound. And this is going to land us in Tartaria very, very quickly. Now, we're going to read the account of Prometheus from the Collier's 1921 Encyclopedia. And it's, it's you know, these things are just so right in your face. But it begins by saying that Prometheus is the son of the Titan Japetus. Now, I wonder who Japetus might be. This is obviously Japheth, yeah. you know. And the Titans, of course, the Titans were the, uh, in the, they were what the Greeks called the giants. They called them the Titans. And the Titans were imprisoned in Tartarus. Now, Tartarus is the, the place where the Tartarians take their name from Tartarus. This is an established fact. We're going, to, we're going to look at that. So this takes us immediately here to uh, Japheth and the scripture into Tartaria. Now let's look at Genesis 10. Oops, sorry. Genesis chapter 10. And it says, now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, or, and they spell it J-E-P-E-T-U-S, Japetus. And that is the, in their story, they change it to Japetus, but it's obviously what they're talking about as we go on. And, and unto them were, were sons born after the flood, and the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshith, and Tyrus. And the, the people of Japheth, they settled in this area by the uh, Caucasian mountains, where the word Caucasian comes from, the area there to the north of the, the Black Sea. And the Tartarians, and we're going to show you some maps here in just a minute, but from this area in the Black Sea, right there at the area of, of Ukraine, it, they went all the way through China, there to the Pacific, Pacific Ocean. And in our broadcast this evening, we are going to trace them as they migrated to the south. And we're going to find some amazing things. And if you think about it, in the Greeks, the Greeks talked about the Titans, the giants. 
And the Greek story, it was Tartarus that was the place where the giants were imprisoned after, by Zeus after they rebelled. Now, in 2 Peter 2 and 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, that word hell there is the Greek word Tartarus. So in Scripture, we see legitimacy being given to the concept of these giants being chained in Tartarus. So basically, the Word of God is saying, yeah, um, they've got the basic story right, but uh, of course, theirs is the demonic version of it. Now, these are some ancient maps of Tartaria, and John, why don't you just speak to those? If you look at maps today, you're not going to see Tartaria, but here on these ancient maps, you can see what we have here. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, one of the books I think you turned me on to, David, is the Maps of the Sea Kings, I believe. Yeah, right? Charles Hapgood, Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. Yes, and, and a lot of these maps you can find in that book. But, you know, I'll tell you, you can, find, you can still find... Uh, old books like encyclopedias that have these maps david has a few of these encyclopedias that have these maps and also talk about tartaria it's pretty interesting too because as much as they've tried to cover it up they one thing they haven't been able to cover up is they haven't been able to get all the old books and all of the old maps but uh i think that these are only three of the maps but there's i think i think we what we found over 50 maps oh, uh, gaggles of them gaggles of them that prove from different people different times that proves that Tartaria is real. So when you when you read that Tartaria is not real, um, if it is a psyop, it's an old running psyop. It's been going for a long time, waiting to pop its head up. You know, this is there's a lot of evidence, a lot of proof of this, and these some of these Tartarian maps make up almost all of the known world. You know, some of them go all the way into California and, yeah. and Alaska. Yeah. And look at that one on the upper left. Yeah. That's North America. Yeah. That's right across into where we are. And yeah. We were talking on the, the Midnight Ride on the Angels of the Waters about French Lick, and I have a book at home on Tartaria that says that the dome at French Lick is Tartarian architecture. Wow. Designed to be, uh, to create a certain sound frequency to, to amplify the healing there from the hot springs that are coming up. And looky here, the Tart, according to this map, Tartaria was even in the United States. Yep. And for you Midnight Ride fans, you might remember when we did the Midnight Ride on Tartaria and yeah. we talked about how that there were Russians that believed that in 1776 we stole Tartaria from them. Yeah. They yeah. still have that fort. Was it Fort? Um, what is the fort that they were talking about over in California? And, I can't um, remember the name of it, but we, we showed the picture of it, an yeah. ancient fort up there in Northern California and all kinds. Yeah of of evidence that remains to this day of that fact and still this is a claim by russian scholars they I, they know this and they believe that i think that that show is called the uh dragon queen of tartaria if i remember correctly because it talks about caliph caliph the idea of uh, yes in cali and all of those different yes. aspects of these aryan gods because they you know eric cali kali which people find in the vedic text they think, oh, they think, oh, it's Hindu, it's all Indian. Well, the Indians are, in fact, are Aryan, and their texts uh -huh. that they get all these from are the Vedic texts, which is an Aryan text. So this is where a lot of this stuff comes from. Now, if we just look before we go on, and you can just see a band, it, it went from the area right where Russia meets with Ukraine there in the Caucasian Mountains. It went to the east all the way through China to the Pacific Ocean, and continued in North America, the complete expanse of it. Now, I believe, and we're going to see some serious reasons to believe that this was the ancient kingdom of Lucifer that is spoken of in Scripture. We're going to see some evidence that would definitely point us to believing that very thing. Now, back again to our Collier's encyclopedia and we're going to unpack the story of prometheus just a little more it just gets more amazing it says here prometheus climbed to the heavens by the assistance of minerva and stole fire from the chariot of the sun now in the movie prometheus which had um 
Charlize Theron and Idris Elba. They, there was a rich guy. <laughs> we could relate to this. There was a multi-trillionaire that give a trillion dollars to have a space flight to go to this planet where they could meet their maker. Well, when they got there, the maker was brought back to life. He was a big Nephilim type guy. And lo and behold, maker wanted to kill his creation. And they were trying to figure out this one girl kept saying, well, who created him? And this plays right into the Kabbalistic narrative where in uh, the, the Zohar of the Kabbalah, the Ein Sof, is the creator of the God of the Bible. Now, a lot of people don't realize that, but this is what the Kabbalah teaches. It also ties right in with the Nagamati Codices, where the creator in the Nagamati Codices is Yalbadoth, the evil co-creator with God. So this is very much that narrative that we saw there in the Prometheus movie. Now, in this text here, it says that Prometheus climbs to the heavens by the assistance of Minerva. Now, that was the Roman god that was the equivalent of Venus, and it's the equivalent of Lucifer and the planet Venus. And we see here that he stole far from the chariot of the sun. Now, we see here in the next, uh, in the next slide, when it says that uh, he ascended into heaven, with the help of Minerva, who is the planet Venus, the goddess representing Venus, this is what we have back in the Lucifer story, don't we? We have Lucifer, Halel ben Shahir, which is another designation for the planet Venus. We see him ascending into heaven. We know the text. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weakens the nations, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And we see here in the story of Prometheus, it's not only telling us the same scenario that we see in the 68th chapter of the book of Enoch, we're seeing really a retelling of the Lucifer story from their side of it, you see. Now, so I, got, I got a question for you. Yeah, sure, quick. go so, right ahead. Go. So, obviously, uh, like uh, Minerva, her her father was Jupiter. Now, Jupiter and Japetus and Japheth, is this the similar, is this the same thing, Jupiter and Japeti? Is that the same thing? No, Japetus okay. was the, uh, the brother, okay, it says here, the son of, Prometheus was the son of the Titan, Japetus. Okay. Japetus was one of the Titans, and he was the brother to Atlas. Okay. So Japetus would have been Atlas's brother, and uh, 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 Prometheus was the son of the Titan, Japetus. Okay. Well, I just didn't know if uh, Jupiter and Japetus had a tie in those two things. I, I just was, was thinking about that because uh, I believe Minerva was the daughter of yeah. Jupiter. Well, they're all sitting in the same dugout. Yeah, they're all playing together. Yeah, they're all sitting in the same dugout. There's no doubt about that. And in this next text in Isaiah 14, 16, this gives me reason to believe because what we're seeing here, we're seeing not only the retelling of the story of, of Enoch 68, but of the whole Lucifer scenario. And it gives me reason to believe that in that swath of land, the old Tartaria all the way even in our land, that this was the ancient kingdom of Lucifer that's spoken of. And for those of you that are new to the Midnight Ride, something um, that I have maintained for a long time, as a matter of fact, it was the very first presentation I ever did at the um, Exposing Darkness back in 2016 with John, that Lucifer is not another name for Satan, that Lucifer, Lucifer is a Nephilim. And it says here, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? And it talks about here the kingdom and the throne of Lucifer, and I believe that ancient Tartaria, this could be very well the, the ancient kingdom of Lucifer, and it talks in the 20th verse here of Isaiah 14. Give me the next slide there, John. There we go. 
Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. And it speaks right here of the Lord erasing the memory of this kingdom of Lucifer. And that's what's happened. You know, people don't, Tartaria is something that's been erased from the mind of mankind because uh, by just stopping talking about it, you know, yeah. and go ahead, John. No, I know I'm at, at all. I'm just reading something here. I was just kind of, I'm going to wait till you get done. Okay. Now let's read another statement here from our Collier's Encyclopedia. It says Jupiter ordered Vulcan to make a woman of clay and endowing her with life, sent her to Prometheus. Prometheus, suspecting the snare, induced his brother to marry her. So we have Prometheus's brother, and we have Jupiter making a woman of clay, wanting Prometheus to mate with her. Prometheus tricks his brother into mating with this clay woman. Now, what's this all about? It sounds a little bit like this, doesn't it? Here in um, in the slide in Daniel here, chapter 2, 42 and 43. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, that's Prometheus's brother marrying the little clay woman that Jupiter made, and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. And it appears that when uh, Nephilim, uh, they can mate with humans easier than one another. They're almost like mules in that respect, I think. But the, the symbolism here is obvious. You know, what does the clay represent? It represents mankind, and it represents the people of God. And this is Satan's agenda all along to corrupt the human genome through the whole Genesis 6 scenario to, you know, in Jeremiah 8 and 6, O house of Israel, cannot I, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. So it's just in your face here, the story of Prometheus. It's the entire Genesis 6 scenario, and it's the story of Lucifer. And as we look at this, I, I have more and more of uh, indication that that old kingdom of Lucifer and the kingdom of Tartaria is the very same thing. Now, let's think about Vulcan for just a little bit. Now, this is the old guy Vulcan here, the god of fire and of smelting iron. And I always think when I see this, when you look at the Capitol Dome and you look up, George Washington is floating up there with old Vulcan. You mm -hmm. know, he's one of the people riding the sky there in the Capitol Dome of this good Christian nation. Yeah. Now, Vulcan, in, uh, there's a book here, and he was the one in the Prometheus story that made the woman of clay for Prometheus's brother to mate with. And in this book here, John Yarker, the Arcane Schools, Yarker, he was a fine fella. He was a friend of Aleister Crowley's, so you knew he was an upright fella. And here in the Arcane Schools, he says this, and boy, he's even got him a little backward swastika on that, so you know he's got to be a fine fella. But he goes on, he says here in this book, he says, all the authorities are agreed that the mysteries practiced under this name were allied with the Cyclopean mysteries. And he says, equally, Tubal Cain and Chrysor is the Vulcan of Greek mythology. Now, this is basically Luciferian Freemasonic theology, and they equate the god Vulcan with Tubal Cain of the Bible. And there, as we see, he goes on to say, uh, he said he also supposes that the confession of Lamech may hint at the beginning of human sacrifice. So their understanding is that the worship of Vulcan, this goes back to Tubal-Cain. Now here we have the, 
the the whole story of the Lion of Cain, the the worship of human sacrifice and the intermingling of the the human and the angelic genome. And we see here the story in Scripture. It talks about Tubal Cain, and this in Freemasonry is the password of the fellow calf degree, Tubal Cain. It's the Masonic password you give with the handshake. It says in Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Neymah. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt, if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Also, theoretically, when we read about what the the Word of God says about Cain being a refuge in the earth, some believe that it's even possible that some of these people of Lamech, for fear of being killed and avenged, actually took shelter in the heart of the earth. Now, this takes us again to Balkane. This takes us right back to Tartaria. This whole story just has little pointers and indicators that point us back to this region. And in Ezekiel 38 and 2, this is the Gog and Magog packa- uh, passages here, and it says, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshish, and Tubal. Right there, we have Tubal right here again. We're right back in Tartaria and prophesy against him. Now, we're going to look at Josephus, and now we're going to begin tracking these Tartarians as they go to the south. And this is some really uh, amazing stuff, and it's so easy to verify historically. It is not difficult at all. In the book of Josephus, on page 36, it says, um, For Gomer founded those who the Greeks call Galatians Gaul, but were then called Gomerites. Magog founded those that were from him named Magogites. And it goes on to say, Of the three sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz founded the Ashkenazians, who are now called by the Greeks, Regenians. So we see that there's a direct connection between these people that are called the Gauls and the Scythians with the people in Galatians. Now this is a 1929 encyclopedia, uh, the World Book of Knowledge, and I'll read a little bit about the Tatars and the Tartarians. You can find a lot of information about, and sometimes it's spelled T-A-T-A-R. And uh, I'll just read what it says here. It says, Tatar took the form Tartar at an early date by association with the word Tartarius or Hades. So they originally were called Tatars, but because they wanted to be associated with hell and the heart of the earth, they called themselves Tartars because of this place where the giant uh, uh, Japetus uh, Prometheus all goes back to. It's amazing. Now, it goes on to say, and I love this, it says there is an there is also an expression, scratch a Russian and you find a Tartar, meaning that beneath the veneer of Russian civilization lies the ferocity of a Tartar. That just makes me think that uh, maybe they might want to be careful uh, about scratching Mr. Putin too many times. A little of that uh, Tartarian ferocity might erupt upon them. Now, in the next uh, little uh, thing I want to read here, and this is from the um, 1937 Encyclopedia Americana, it says the Tartars were a nomadic people anciently spoken of as the Scythians. So we can document that the Scythians and the Tartars are the same people. When these Tartarians begin to migrate to the south, down into Asia Minor, 
they were known as the Scythians and then as the Gauls. It's all the same people as we trace them down in their migration to the south. It says the true Tatars form part of the horde of Genghis Khan. And if you know anything about Genghis Khan, he was known for his ferocity. The whole of uh, the Khans of the Tartarians in Star Trek, they picked up the narrative of the wrath of Khan. You know, these are big, they're bad, and they did things that they were the original terrorists. They did things to, they didn't just kill you, but they killed you with style, and they did innovative things to the people's bodies uh, after that they had killed them. Now, in the uh, natural history here of Pliny the Elder, we're going to read about some things, and in as we come down into Gaul, Gaul is the region there in Asia Minor where the Apostle Paul founded a church, and he wrote the epistle to the Galatians to the Gauls. Now, I want to read from Pliny the Elder. This is uh, chapter, book two, volume two, in his natural history. I'm going to read from page 62 about some strange goings-on down in the area of Gaul. When these creatures, or well, not creatures, well, some of them were creatures, when these uh, Gomerian giants, as we're going to read, um, Steve Quayle in Genesis 6 Giants has a good chapter on the Gomerian giants that come from Gomer in Genesis 10 as we trace them downward into the region of Galatia. Then we can also take them right over. They became the Druids. These were the Druidic people as they went um, in, into Britain. But this is what it says about some of the strange going-ons in Gaul. And Pliny the Elder, he was like the Roman Josephus, such a cool guy. I hope he got saved. Um, he actually died when Mount Vesuvius erupted. He, he, was, he was in Pompeii at the wrong time and got buried there by the volcano. But, I mean, he was contemporary with Josephus. And uh, he, uh, j just a cool guy. But I'll read what he had to say here about some strange going on in the area of Gaul. He said, also the governor of Gaul wrote to the late lamented Augustus that a large number of dead Nereids were to be seen on the shore. Now we're going to show you some picture of some Nereids here in just a little bit. And basically, they're sea nymphs, or what we call a sea nymph or a mermaid, half fish, half woman. And they actually talked, and you know, this isn't a fairy tale book, and these old books, they talked of the nymphs and the nerds of being real, and even recounting a letter from the governor of Gaul to Augustus Caesar about these creatures washing up dead on the shore. He said, I have, he said, I have distinguished members of the order of knighthood as authorities for the statement that a man of the sea has been seen by them in the Gulf of Cadiz, that's very near the Straits of Gibraltar, with a complete resemblance to a human being in every part of his body, and that he climbs on board ships during the hours of the night, and the side of the vessel that he sits on is at once weighed down, and if he stays there longer, actually goes below the water. He goes on to talk about a monster that was found in this area. He says the skeleton of the monster to which Andromeda in the story was exposed was brought by Marcus Scarus from the town of Jaffa in Judea and shown at Rome among the rest of the marbles during his edelship. It was 40 feet long, the height of the ribs exceeding the elephants of India, and the spine being one foot six inches thick. All kinds of strange animals and strange creatures were showing up in this area, and it can directly be attributed to the migration of these uh, Gomerian giants as they come down from Tartaria into the area here of Asia Minor. You know, just to back that up, too, there's a book called The Imminent Invasion of Israel that talks about, uh, and I'm just going to read this part right here, and this is, I can find this, and this is a Schofield Study Bible as well, but there's other other sources for this. It says, the primary reference to the northern powers headed by Russia, all agreed, the reference to Meshech and Tubal was Moscow and Tobolsk, and it's a clear identification. Then it goes on to say that they went down by the Caspian Sea and all the area, Black Sea and all that stuff that you're talking about. 
uh, as well here. So, I mean, there's there's a lot of evidence that, that proves this, which is interesting because this is not something I ever understood or, or knew as, you know, being a possibility. Uh, you, you just never think of that as even the, the etymology of words is so interesting when yeah. it comes to this, you yeah. know. Yeah. And, of course, when you take the word Tatar, Tartar, Tartaria, rip it from the modern mindset of mankind, you're yeah. never going to connect these dots. Yeah. But just do a little digging, the dots start connecting, yep. and a lot of things start making a lot more sense. Now, this is a picture of what, uh, in uh, Pliny's Natural History, he records a letter from the uh, governor of Gaul to Augustus Caesar about a number of these creatures washing up dead on the shore. Uh, they maybe had a train derailment. You reckon? And a little, to <laughs> a little toxic chemicals got in the water. Must you know, a little that, little of that uh, rainbow water, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, this nearid. Uh, here's a picture of what we're talking about. These, uh, uh, call them what you want. We've got. Uh, they're like they live in the sea. They're female. The like, sea hookers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's about uh, what they can. Of course, they're very much like the nymphs, which is. Um, a, 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 a sexual connotation, the mermaid and all of these things. But the, there's actual records that they, they and you know, this isn't a, a fairy book. This is a very credible history book that is recording these events. And he said that, yeah, right up here, uh, the governor of Gaul said, man, you know, we got these things washing up on our shore. You know, a bunch of these nerds. Um and as we go on here, I'll read a little bit from Genesis 6 Giants by Steve Foley. He has a good chapter in this book on the Gomerian Giants. As we trace them, we, we trace them coming down from the Caspian Sea area right down into Asia Minor where we see uh, Galatia and Paul writing the epistle to the church he founded in Galatia. Now, it says here, this is on page 214, it says the Cimbri, or the Sumerians, after making their way overland by the northern route, occupied for a time the country above the Euxene or Black Sea around the Paulus Metoidus. When they again felt the irresistible urge to roam, they continued westward, eventually settling east of the Rhine in Germany. They afterward established themselves as far north as Denmark and also colonized Belgium, Akman's hordes, meanwhile, having advanced by the southern route, first settled in Cappadocia and Galatia, and then later on the southern shores of the Black Sea. From there they spread into Gaul, which today we call France, and also across from Spain, where they assimilated from the Iberians and thus became known as the Celtiberians. Being as prolific in Europe as they had been in Asia, Gomer's oversized children soon spread over a vast territory from the lands east of the Rhine to the Atlantic and from the Baltic Sea to the coast of Spain. They also inhabited Switzerland and some northern parts of Italy, especially around the Adriatic. So he rightly traces the migration of these people. Basically, they just spread and uh, they just went out in all kinds of directions. Now I'm going to read something from this collection of books called The Great Books of the Western World. We're going to read from volume six here. And this is the writings of Herodotus. And he talks about the behavior of these Scythian warriors. And we, we already we read the documentation from the old encyclopedia that the Scythians were the Tartarians. This is what they called what they were called as they moved to the south. And it says here, this is another, this is a Roman historian, Herodotus. He says, uh, the Scythian soldiers drinks the blood of the first man he overthrows in battle. Whatever number he slays, he cuts off all their heads and carries them to the king since he is thus entitled to a share of the booty. The skulls of their enemies... Not indeed. This is on page 134 and 135, if any of you have this set. 
It says here, the skulls of their enemies, not indeed of all, but of those whom they most detest, they treat as follows. Having sawn off the portion below the eyebrows and cleaned out the inside, they cover the outside with leather. When a man is poor, this is all that he does. But if he is rich, he also lines the inside with gold. In either case, the skull is used as a drinking cup. They do the same with the skulls of their own and the, it, own kin if they have been at feud with them. So these were bad dudes. They'd kill you and they were creative about it. They'd kill you and they'd make a little drinking cup out of your head. You know, these, they would drink your blood and make a cup out of your head. You know, these were bad guys. And they were known, uh, if you know anything about uh, Genghis Khan, and I know that you do, the, the ferocity of, of these people, they were just frightening. You know, they were, they were just a terrifying figure. Now, we're going to look at a old book here. This is the Thomas Scott Bible Commentary. It's one of the, I think it's the oldest set of commentaries I have. It's 1816, and it's still in use. We haven't dry docked it. We're still using it. And I want to read from this to show you how things have changed. The, the very name, Tatar, Tartar, Tartaria, they're meaningless to the modern mind because they have been deliberately ripped from the, the pages of history because these are things that they don't want people to know. But this commentary, which was written in 1816, it says this in the introduction to the epistle of Galatians. Now, what I want to show you is that this has all been changed. Um, if you would read a modern Bible commentary from uh, someone that has come recently out of theological cemetery, they would go into a big deal about, well, we have the Northern Galatian uh, hypothesis and we have the Southern Galatian hypothesis, and we believe the Southern Galatian hypothesis, which basically means the, the truncated story of this is that from the time there were ever Christians until the late 1800s, everybody knew that the book of Galatians was written to the Gallic people. Now, what they say is that the book of Galatians was written to a Roman province called Galatia that weren't the ethnic Gauls. So they have totally severed the connection between the book of Galatians and the Gomerian giants. Now, we're going to understand just how important that is. And these little things that seem insignificant, like who cares, they disconnect the dots that enable us to put together the full picture of the story. Let me read just a little bit from Mr. Scott's introduction to the book of Galatians. He says, the Galatians, or Gallo-Grecians, were the descendants of the Gauls, who migrated from their own country to seek for new settlements and who, after a variety of disasters, got possession of a considerable district in Asia Minor near to Lyconia, Lystra, and Iconum. You can read right in the book of Acts where Paul visited those places on his missionary journeys. It says, it is supposed that they retained their native language and customs at the time when the gospel was first preached among them. Now, this is huge. This is really huge because when we get this, we can really figure some stuff out. Often when I uh, talk about the book of Galatians, I'll say, look at your neighbor and say, the Galatians weren't Jews. Uh -huh. And the Galatians were the Gauls. And just like it says in the Thomas Scott commentary, they were practicing their customs and rituals at the time the gospel was preached to them in about 50 A.D. Now, going on here, we're going to look at the text in Galatians 4, and we're going to see what difference it would make. When we look at the book of Galatians, does it make any difference? Well, northern Galatian, apostles, southern. But it does because when you divorce the Galatians from the ethnic Gauls, and the, the rituals that they were doing, as Thomas Scott said, and every, every commentary from when Christ rose from the dead to the late 1800s, 18, 18, it would say the same thing Thomas Scott did, but now, no more, no more. Now, it says here, but now, 
after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Now, the question is, what were the Galatians going back to? And as Thomas Scott said, at the very time when the gospel was preached to them, they were still practicing the rites and the customs of the, the Gallic people. And we're going to show you just exactly what those are. Get your golden bow ready. We're, we're going to be reading from that. Now, before we go to the Britannic, I just want to read a little commentary here from Thomas Scott on this passage in Galatians. It says, the Galatians had, had formerly been ignorant of the one living and true God and had performed religious service to mere creatures or imaginary beings which by nature were not gods and external observances might accord very well to such objects of worship. So we're not talking about them. They weren't Jews. They never celebrated the Feast of Passover. They did the doggone Gallic rites, which we're going to show you exactly what they were. Now, when, when you sever the book of Galatians from the Gallic people, it's like a little bird. There's a trail of breadcrumbs from Galatians 4 right back to Tartaria, right back to the Gomerian giants, right back to the satanic worship that was instituted by the fallen angels with the sons of God and the daughters of men. When you cut that connection, it's like a little bird just eating those breadcrumbs up to where they don't want anyone to trace that trail back. Now, going forward, it's interesting, too, where those breadcrumbs will take you. He goes on to say, Brother Scott in his commentary, the best illustration of the absurd conduct which the apostle ascribes to the Galatians may be found in the church of Rome, in which the worship of saints and angels succeeded to that of the inferior deities, the superstitions, and often licentious festivals which were multiplied among them. Well, happy Saturnalia, happy Baal Mass, and it shows the explicit, direct, satanic nature of that which is done in this celebration of the satanic rites of Baal Mass, which is worshipped under the uh, in the modern abomination that we see that tries to pass itself off as Christianity. Now let's look at the 1771 Britannica. That was the very first edition, and let's read a little article here about the Gali, the Gali. And it says, and the Gali, it says, in antiquity, the priest of the goddess Cybele, who were eunuchs and took their name from Gallus, a river in Phrygia. When a youth was initiated into this order, the custom was to throw off his clothes, to run crying aloud in the midst of the troop, and then drawing a sword to castrate himself. After this, he ran about the streets, carrying in his hands the marks of his mutilation, which he was to throw into a house, and in that house to put on a woman's dress. <laughs> now, have you seen this spirit manifesting oh, lately? Man. Oh, man. Now, I don't think I want to sign up for that, but these golly, these priests, they would literally cut their plumbing off, they would put it in their little hands, and they would throw it at a house. And this house had to bring them out of dress to wear. What a horrible religion. That's all I got to say. <laughs> don't, don't wait for me to get in line and sign up for no, that one. Don't I, sign me up for that religion, man. Oh, my gosh. But can we see that same spirit manifesting today? We can't miss it, can we? No. And this spirit, and you know, people say, well, it doesn't hurt a bit. Uh, we, we don't worship the Christmas tree. It doesn't hurt a bit. Well, look what's happening. Look <laughs> what's happening. <laughs> this demonic spirit has taken over our nation. It hurts somebody a bit, didn't Something's it? Something's gone wrong. Something. And instead of standing up, they can't get anything out of their mouth to say nothing. They just keep doing the rites of the priest of golly. You're disgusting. You're disgusting. And that's okay because you disgust God too. You're disgusting. These are satanic rites. Wake your little self up. 
If you got any spiritual life or a brain left in your head, it's time to wake up. It now make, it makes total sense why they covered all this up, not just because of the covering up the practices that they were doing, but like you said, the practices that they are doing because it's exactly the same yeah. things. And you're getting ready to prove it with the one of my favorite books on yeah. the subject. So all right. Let's get her golden bow out. And uh, I know a lot of our listeners, friends that have got the Golden Bow refer to it so much. Just, a, 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 you know, it's just really a useful book. And we're going to read from the Golden Bow from page 404. And we're going to expand a little bit on the article we saw in the 1771 edition of Britannica. And it says, um, the worship of the Fergian mother of the gods was adopted by the Romans in 204 B.C. toward the close of their long struggle with Hannibal. Certainly the Romans were familiar, this is on page 404, certainly the Romans were familiar with the Gali, who the emasculated priest of Attis before the close of the Republic. Now, it goes on to talk about the great spring festival of Cybele and Attis. On the 22nd day of March, a pine tree was cut in the woods and brought into the sanctuary of Cybele, where it was treated as a great divinity. The duty of carrying the sacred tree was entrusted to a guild of tree bearers. Now, the Arch Gallus, <laughs> the high priest of the Gali was called the Arch Gallus after the Gauls. In other words, he was the big Gaul, the arch Gauls. <laughs> this is right on page 205 or 405, the Golden Bow. It says the arch, the Archie Gaulus, or high priest, drew blood from his arms and presented it as an offering. Nor was he alone in making this bloody sacrifice. Stirred by the wild barbaric music and clashing cymbals, rumbling drums, droning horns, and screaming flutes, the inferior clergy whirled about in the dance and waggling heads and screaming hair until wrapped into a frenzy of excitement and insensible to pain, they gashed their bodies with potsherds or slashed them with knives in order to bespatter the altar of the sacred tree with their flowing blood. This is the, <laughs> there's a couple, <laughs> you know, how to say it, but just to say it, but uh, this is the origin of the balls on the Christmas tree, and this is the origin of the red and green, uh, the Christmas colors, the red and green. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, it, it's true. It says that um, uh, potsherds slashed them with knives in order to bespatter the altar of the sacred tree with the flowing blood. The ghastly rite probably formed a part of the mourning for Addis and may have been intended to strengthen him for the resurrection. It was on the same day of blood and for this purpose that the novices sacrificed their virility wrought up to the highest pitch of religious excitement. They dashed the severed portions of themselves against the image of the cruel goddess. Just absolutely amazing. And this is what the Apostle Paul was saying. You're going to go back into this. I fear that I have put labor upon you in vain. You're going to lose your goofy souls. You cannot do this and be a child of God at the same time. So what do these? I'll, I'll just dispense with the adjectives because I'm just going to go off. But what do these people think? You know, what are you thinking? That you can do these satanic rituals and not be a stench in the nostrils of God? Really? You think that? And that it doesn't hurt anything when the very spirit of the Gali has taken over this nation and all you can do, you can't get anything out of your cowardly minds, mouths to speak against it, and you commit the very rituals of the people that committed these abominations? You disgust me. And that's okay because you disgust God too. You're disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. You're not a part of the solution. You're a part of the problem. You need to repent, and you need to do it really, really quickly. And, you know, it, I imagine they had a hard time proselytizing and getting people to join that religion. I can't see how anybody would say, you know, like, they, 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 how, how do they appeal to people? Be like, man, if you join our club, you'll get to cut your manhood off and throw it at a tree like how you know, like, like i can't believe it and now they do these rituals today 
that are just they're the same thing, but like I guess in a softer way. I kind of wish they would go back to the old way of doing it. If they're going to do it, might as well go all in, right? Yeah, might as well. And th that is to me unthinkable. Yeah, how anyone could go for that, but yet today there are hundreds of young children being coerced into chemical castration. Yeah, and little oh, yeah. girls that are being um, coerced into these things. It's the spirit of the golly. It it's still the there, man. The it's still oh, yeah. there, and and parents are not only letting it happen, but some of them are encouraging their children to do such yeah. a thing. Yeah. So. Yeah, they actually are, but we see when we peel back the onion that knowing about Tartaria tells us a lot about ourselves, and that uh, the things we see unpacked in these stories that shows us what's going on right now. We are wrestling with these same ancient principalities. And, you know, what can you say? But there it is, um, the giants of Tartaria. What an interesting show, man. I, I always love the subject of Tartaria. I believe we we started doing shows about Tartaria a couple, two or three years ago, somewhere in that range. And every time we just find more and more about it. And I think, I really do think this, and, I've, and, I, and maybe at first I didn't know so much, but I think Tartaria is going to play a major role the discovery of Tartaria and the unveiling of who they are is going to be a major role in a lot of what's going on in the end here. And I don't yeah. know how, but there, it just seems that more and more is coming out about it to the point to where it's almost like they're going to unveil something pretty heavily. I mean, it's just, it's been yeah. such a release of information lately. There was just recently found a statue of an ancient angel in Russia. No, uh, I saw that. Very, yes. very fascinating. He was like holding a sword and like a, a, a tablet or something, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very fascinating. And as the Book of Enoch says in the very, um, I'll read it again. We can't read it too much. That's why we're so thankful. And we've been so blessed to be able to do the Book of Common, Enoch Commentary on the Subscription Network. And thank you, by the way, each and every one of you that subscribes to that to help enable Now You See TV to do what we do. But in Enoch chapter 1, verse 1, the words of the blessing of Enoch, where he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. And through just a study and a meditation on uh, the 68th chapter of the book of Enoch, we can see the same story being retold, and yeah. it just unpacks. It just unpacks. And you can see the... Um, the tremendous importance of this understanding of Tartaria, these ancient Tartarian giants, and it very much affects us today. And we're wrestling with these same ancient principalities and these same ancient principalities, and we've talked about this on previous Midnight Rides, they're putting together right now these ancient coalitions that are getting ready for World War III. You know, we see it happening over and over on the... Uh, the cover of the Financial Times of London this week. There was a picture of the mullah of Iran in Beijing with Xi Jinping reviewing the um, <laughs> Chinese military. And I don't know how long ago it was, but we talked about the from the Book of Second Estrus, the connections between the dragons of the East and, uh, and Iran. And it was within about 48 hours they announced this multi-million dollar pact between Russia and Iran. This is just deepening. Yeah. The ties are deepening between China, Russia, Iran. We see these ancient spirits gathering these nations together. And all of the things are falling in place for this final, uh, this final episode. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so crazy to me, too. You know, the, in the Bible, it talks about where Antipas was was martyred is where Satan's seat is. And, and of course, you look at that, and that takes you to Turkey. That takes you yeah. right there in the Turkish area. Yeah. Some people say it's in Geneva area, but it's it's there in Turkey, and which is all the same area there, basically. But like you said, right now we have all of this stuff going on. Right now there was a big earthquake that just happened in Turkey uh, just recently right around that same area. Um, there's the struggles that they're having with, uh, you know, the Bible talks about he stirs up the kings of the north and, and those people in that area. And this is who we're talking about here. This is such a huge um, portion of people that we don't really hear a whole lot about, except for recently. You know, you have the Russia, whole the Russia-Ukraine incident, but you don't really hear a whole lot about You hear a lot about Kansas and, and all that, but what people fail to realize is that 
continued on and they they bred with people up there um you can even trace and this is a show in the future but you can even trace uh the descendants of nimrod as children to the hungarians the 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 huns right this yeah. is where the huns come from yeah which were also called the turkish people and yeah. out of all the small hapler groups of the of blood groups that were there guess who became on, on top of that whole country guess who the kings that are descended of are descendants of the huns the turkish people and this is yeah. this whole area so they've they mixed in so much and that's why it's so confusing i think too because you hear all these different histories about these people this people that people but in a show you did about esau and showing his um his joining ranks with all of these people as well the, it's hard to distinguish the descendants of Cain, the descendants yeah. of Shem, the descendants yeah. of Japheth, and also yeah. on top of that, the Galatian story is a clear indication that that God saw fit to forgive some of the uh, Gomerian people, some of the yeah. sons of Japheth as yeah. well. And there is a there is a prophecy that Japheth will enlarge the tents of Shem. Well, it will, you know, enlarge the tents of Shem, which kind of yeah. is an interesting thing as well. Yeah, so much to this, and the the way that uh, studying into this. Um, the Galatian people, the Gali, were the ruling class over the Gauls there. And yeah. it says they were like a foot taller than the common people. Wow. So there were a lot of Galatians that were just pretty much as we would be. Yeah. And then there was this ruling priest of the Gali that had this high concentration of ethylene blood. They were a foot or more taller than the average people. Yeah. And they were the ones that did the rites of Addis and, and all of this and uh, it, it's just amazing, and it, it's a matter, you know, of uh, some of the most iconic warriors, Attila the Hun and Genghis Khan, these uh, Tartarian warlords, they're yeah. iconic for their yeah. ferocity and yeah. uh, the things that they did. And it talks about in the Gallic Wars when Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar, he made a lot of his street cred in defeating these people, and they were huge. And they would uh, they would ride their horses naked, and they were just huge, and they were just jacked up and crazy, just wow. fearsome people. And what Caesar did, he uh, he told his soldiers to dismount, and they took their broadswords, and as they came in, they would uh, hack the horses, and they would down the horses, and then swarm on them and hack them together with their broadswords. And that was a strategy used to defeat these Gauls. But the Gauls, they went right into Rome. You know, they they totally kicked their butt, and they went right into Rome, and they had to all gather in in one place to not be totally exterminated. They yeah. were fierce warriors. Yeah. And finally, Caesar uh, figured out a way to beat them. But yeah, they were they were something. Uh, they really were, and they were the many of the ancient historians called them the tallest people on earth. And this, the the priesthood of the Galilee, as they migrated uh, over into Britain, they became the uh, the Druidic and the Celtic people. And yeah. we just see this strain of religion. But the more, and just like that one statement, these people just disseminated everywhere. And now we don't, when we read Scythian, we don't understand the Scythians were the Tartarians. Yeah. But, and then you have all of these connections, and it takes a little work. But after a while, you can put together a lot of things to figure out what these people are doing. And you're talking about that, the earthquake in Turkey, what I think about. Well, a lot of things I think about when that happens. But, you know, what you've been talking about, the angels of the river Euphrates. Yeah. You know, when we got this big earthquake, is something being released here? Yeah. You know. It seems like it, doesn't it, man? I mean, you, you have so many crazy things. Like, for the, for instance, the, the day it happened, that's when the Grammys had that big, celebration of satan performing there and it just makes you wonder man you have cern in that area you have so many things that are that are just popping out in the open another thing that concerns me about tartaria too and the and the idea of it propping up lately is you know you have charles is the third like charles the third who's the king right now he is actually of romanov bloodline and for those people yeah. who don't know about the romanovs they were the kings of uh of russia tartaria before the uh, communists came in, uh, Bolsheviks came in and yeah. killed every single one of them, right? You have the, the Disney movie Anastasia talking about Anastasia Romanoff, right? You have all these different things that people, a lot of people don't really know about this, but there's different books that tie in Romanoff to Rome, uh, tie in uh, 
all kinds of weird things. You know, moving the capital to Moscow from St. Petersburg is like an old Tartarian play, I guess. They, you know, going back to that. Just oh, there's yeah. so many weird things that are just like, just all kind of hitting at the same time. And to me, there's never there's never any kind of coincidence with this stuff. It just it's there and it's here for a reason right now. There's people seeing this. And I, like I said, I, I know that it has to do with Bible prophecy and tying all that in, but there's a lot of people that really think Tartaria and their Tartarian magic, all the stuff that they're doing, were actually like they are the kingdom of God, right? There's a lot yeah. of, there's a lot of new yeah. agers that believe oh, that. Yeah. And so yeah, sure that's one reason we do want to talk about it too, because we want to give the, the counter idea that it, it's possibly not the, the golden, golden people that they're looking for. Right. Yeah. So. And we have just found out, uh, Joshua Watts and I on our little recent excursion over there into French Lick that there, it has become a real gathering place. Just, uh, uh, just about a half hour from here of new age groups. It's becoming a big new age gathering place right yeah. over there in French Lick festivals oh, yeah. and seminars and big, huge gatherings. So yeah, it all goes together. It all certainly does go together. It really does, man. Well, you know, this is a great time to slow down our ride for just a second and just thank everybody and say thank you guys so much for um, listening, for sharing, for all the support that you guys give. We could not do this without you. You um, make not only your sharing and stuff, just your support, but you guys get this message out to so many different people. I mean, so many thousands of people that are hearing the Word of God and hearing it in a way that they haven't heard it in a long time, for hundreds of years people haven't taught this way and i'm not saying that there aren't other people out there like us doing this but for hundreds of years in the mainline christian church this stuff wasn't talked about this no. stuff was suppressed this stuff is hidden and there's a reason behind it and we yeah. expose all of that so we yeah. thank you guys for listening subscribe david anything else you got to say and then we end us out well um just great thankfulness to all of our listeners and you know we're all in this ride together you know, and what we say here, we document very meticulously. And we know that you are an extremely intelligent listening audience that you're studying, you're looking, and you're digging. And we're on this big ride together. And it's a marvelous thing. The line between uh, heaven and hell is whether or not you love the truth. You know, because they receive not the love of the truth, they get the strong delusion. So we, you're either going to love the truth or get the strong delusion. Here, we're going to love the truth, and we're going to go after it. That's we're right. going to go after it. And we know that you are on this big ride with us, and it's a marvelous thing. And it'll be a marvelous thing for as many of you can to get down to Nashville in April and meet us. It's just, just going to be a great thing. It's just going to be fizzy pop. I, I found a cool place today, David, by the way. I posted it on a Facebook story. It was a place that I went today in Evansville. And I, I guess it used to be something pretty big at one time, but it's like it has it went inside there and it was where I was going to my nephew. He they rented this little place out. And it had like all kinds of like it had the Ark of the Covenant in it, it had like a Noah's Ark inside of it. It had like a sarcophagus with like a big Egyptian tune. It had like a makeshift temple inside of it. A uh, makeshift room, like in for Revelation, that had like all of the angels surrounding the throne. It was really cool. Oh, I've never, gosh. and it's like I've never heard of such. It's thing. been pretty much abandoned. It looks like for years. Like the sign on it's like faded out, and that's the first time I ever been there. First time I heard of it. So cool place for a meet and greet. We'll have to do well, sometime. Yeah. yeah, I've never heard of such thing. Absolutely. Yeah, I always like these little weird places. Oh, my wife, yeah. my wife was like, "This looks like something you would do." When you get a little older and a little crazier, I was like, you know what? You, you, I would do it now if I had the money to yeah, do it. So. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm absolutely. a little crazier than she thinks, I think. But anyways, today we're going to do the Pounders Pound, too. This is something where we all pound the, pound the like button at the same time uh, to progress the algorithm here on YouTube. Hopefully that's what it does. We don't know for sure, but that's what they tell us it does. So, David, you want to do the Pounders Pound with us? All right. Here we go all together. One, One two, two, three. three. Boom. boom boom we pounded that pound button i could feel the vibrations all in the right studio. there we go shaking uh, and a quaking shaking and a quaking thank you guys so much for listening davis send us out we'll see you guys next time on the midnight ride as always with deep humility to the lord for everything good that happens and to each and every one of you that prays for us and enables us to do what we do thank you so much and a big high five and a good night to everybody from the Midnight Ride till next Saturday night, 10 p.m. Central. 
High five and good night, everybody. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up.